So the next class I'm going to talk about is mind matter interaction. Uh, mind matter interaction, uh, the way we cast it in, at the uh, Institute of Nordic Sciences, is we're looking at the role of consciousness in the physical world. From, uh, from a neuroscience point of view, or maybe a mainstream science point of view, the answer to what is the role of consciousness in the physical world is there is none, or it's a side effect that is meaningless, or we don't know. So that's why we're interested in it. So we think maybe it does have something to do with the structure of the physical world. And so without further ado, here's the author of Mind Over Matter. <laughs> so when I talk about this topic, people immediately think of spoon bending, and they think of levitation, they think of other things like that. Uh, I tend to think of it more in terms of quantum mechanics because there's a potential opening within interpretations of quantum mechanics for where there should be a connection between mind and matter. And one way to look at it then is within uh, the famous double sit experiment, that if you, you shoot photons or electrons or any elementary particle through double slit, you'll end up with an interference pattern on the other side, little bands where the, the photons, say, are showing up. This is where the staring at photons comes into play. Uh, but this is only true if you don't know which slit that the, the photon went through. If you do know which slit the photon goes through, then when you do the same experiment, you don't get interference anymore. You get a pattern which suggestive of particles. And so one way of interpreting this is that there's something about observation or knowledge or information that so-called collapses the quantum wave function. Now, I know that there are other interpretations of this, but this is a viable explanation for what's going on. There's something about consciousness that observes the physical world in a certain way and causes it to leave its potential state and, and adopt an actual state. So I thought, okay, this looks like it would be useful for an experiment. We can actually test this idea that consciousness has something to do with it. And so we consider the following experiment. We take a random number generator that's based on quantum events. In this case, it's uh, um, electron tunneling through Zener diode. It used to uh, create random numbers, binary bits, or random bits. You create a random walk from that, and you give instructions to somebody to aim high, to make the random walk go up, say. And if they do that sufficiently and, and repeatedly enough, then you have some evidence that the randomness is not acting random anymore. And since we know the randomness is traced down to the quantum level, maybe the person's intention or attention is pushing the probabilities around and slightly collapsing the wave function. You do this experiment lots of times. You ask them to aim high and to aim low and to do nothing. And here's a, a summary of a 12-year program done at Princeton University looking at this exact target, a true random number generator, aim high, aim low, do a baseline. And they got results that were pretty much in the direction suggesting that somehow your intention goes into the world and it pushes probabilities around, perhaps at the quantum scale. This was based on over 100 subjects, 12 years, five investigators, 800,000 samples involved in one, one laboratory. And so one of the criticisms of, of this as, as an effort, a 12-year effort, is, well, your lab got it. Maybe it was a mistake. What do other people get? So fortunately, this experiment's fairly easy to do and it's been published a lot of times. So in uh, 2006, there was a meta-analysis of 372 publications involving 90 principal investigators, about 20 laboratories also, and their conclusion was a small magnitude, statistically highly significant event or effect, which these authors preferred to believe was due to selective reporting of positive experiments. I, I've been able to show, and other colleagues have shown, that this is extremely unlikely to be the case, and there are methods used in meta-analysis to estimate how many studies would you actually need in order to nullify this if it was selective reporting. And so I think, given the number of researchers who have done this over the past 20 to 40 years, there simply aren't enough people out there to have done experiments that uniformly failed and set them aside. So I think there is a real effect here. And so the, the reaction of the, of the mainstream basically is don't pay any attention to this. <laughs> Maybe it'll go away. And the cat is interesting because it suggests another way of doing this experiment based on the Schrodinger's cat paradox. So you have a cat in there that is both alive and dead before you observe it. Of course, Schrodinger used this as an absurdity case to show why there was, must be something wrong with quantum mechanics because observation couldn't possibly have anything to do with it because otherwise you'd have a, a live and dead cat. But it does raise the question that if you're able to observe 
in the sealed box, could you help the cat stay alive, if you wished, because you're now collapsing it into one form rather than the other. Well, we did this experiment. <laughs> And in order to pass our institutional review board, we had a promise we would not harm any cats. So instead, we decided to use photons. So here's a Michelson interferometer, and the experiment is very simple. You send in a, a laser beam, and it splits, and it hits mirrors, it comes back, and it creates an interference pattern. And we asked people to put your mind's eye to observe, with your mind only, that portion, that arm of the interferometer. And to imagine that you can either block the photons, or you can see the photons, or you can do something with the photons in order to observe them. Here's another view of it. Here's the incoming photon, or the light beam bounces off. It creates this pattern, which in this case now is uh, concentric circles. There's the interference. So what we hope happens is that when we ask people to put their mind in the box, essentially, that the interference pattern will be slightly decreased. It's not going to decrease as much as putting your hand over the beam, it's not like that, but it might be changed in a way, and specifically changed in a way which is consistent with a collapse of the wave function, which would mean collapse of a part of the interference pattern. So here's what it looks like. Uh, the, the whole optical apparatus is inside our shielded room, and we're, it's also made light tight. We have somebody outside, in this case a meditator, who's asked to put your mind in that place I showed you inside the sealed container. Uh, for a period of time and then remove your mind when I ask you to take your mind out. Uh, meanwhile, we have a, uh, a cooled CCD camera which is able to measure single photons. We're able to image what the interference pattern looks like. The protocol is to compare what's happening in the interference pattern during observation versus no observation in 20 second chunks. So the instruction to the subject is for the next 20 seconds, put your mind in the box where I showed you. And then 20 seconds later, I say, now take it out and relax. And I put it back in, back and forth. So here's the result. The result for no one observing is basically a flat line. This is showing the, um, the intensity, the illumination intensity uh, of the, the interference pattern. And it's the difference in the interference pattern when in the condition of observe and no observe, but under conditions where it's calibration. There isn't even anybody in the lab is to see whether the instrumentation is working right. It should be zero across the board, and in fact it is. There's no effect that we see. If you have somebody there and is actually observing with their mind, you get a drop, and the drop in this case is consistent with the idea that there is less interference when they're observing with their mind. So this was what we were hoping to see, something like this, that there would be a change in the interference pattern. Uh, the effect was almost entirely due to the meditators. We had both meditators and non-meditators involved in this task. The meditators that we had, we selected meditators because this task involves mental attention and sustained mental attention, in this case, for 20 seconds. And so we know that if you ask a meditator who's trained in attention to do something for 20 seconds with their mind, they're able to do that a lot better than somebody who has not meditated at all. The, the non-meditators in this test would, would be able to put their mind in the box for about a second, and then they would start thinking about lunch. <laughs> the meditators would start thinking about lunch after 15 seconds, but it was a lot longer. So we, we got a, a bigger effect. So I published this in, in 2008. The meditators' overall result was pretty good, 9.4 times 10 to the minus 6 probability for the effect that they got. And the non-meditators actually didn't get anything. So I then had, uh, decided to go from a Michelson interferometer, which is convenient because it's pretty big, you can easily describe to somebody what to do, and to use an actual double slit system. The advantage of the double slit system is that it's much more stable than, than a Michelson interferometer, because if you ever work with interferometers, you know that they're very useful for measuring everything, not only little tiny things, but vibration. They're very sensitive to vibration. Whereas a double slit system is less susceptible to vibration because the two slits, which, which is where the interference is going to happen, are mounted on the same slide. So if they're bouncing around a little bit, you will get some noise in there, but not anywhere near as much as a Michelson interferometer. The challenge, though, is to ask people to do this task. Imagine that you can put your eye in front of a 10 micron slit and either block the slit or see what's going on there. And so people will say, well, I can't even see the slit with my eye. How do you expect me to do this? And I said, well, use your imagination. 
If they complain that they can't imagine it, we don't use them. Fortunately, most people are able to imagine it. Most people end up, uh, what we really want them to do is observe what's going on. It turns out to be kind of difficult to imagine that you can observe photons going through 10 microns. So instead, I say, okay, just imagine you can block a slit. You can put your imaginary hand out and force one of the slits to close. That would also collapse the interference because now all you have is diffraction rather than two slits. So that's the task. This is what their, our first system looked like. It's a helium neon laser and the double sits inside the box, and then we have a camera looking at the interference pattern. The whole thing is sealed, so people can't see anything. They have to use their mind's eye. There's the line camera, there's the double slit holder, the beam, the laser beam goes in there. There I am working on the, on the apparatus. And so what the camera sees is a very nice, pretty, perfectly well-behaved interference pattern. We take the Fourier transform of that, uh, the reason we do that is because one way of doing this is you can look at the height of the peaks and the height of the troughs, and when interference goes away, the troughs all start moving up. In fact, if there's no interference at all, you don't have any troughs. You just have a diffraction pattern, which is this envelope. But the other way of looking at it is to do the Fourier transform, in which case this peak is the double slit power. And so that peak gives us a way of looking at the entire pattern, and we now can make a prediction about what would happen in the, in the experiment. We would predict, first of all, here's a double, here's the single slit power, this, this peak. There's the double slit power. We would predict that if it's true that something about the mind's eye observing this system, we would predict that the double slit power should go down, less interference. And so that's the task. That person thinks about this. We simply take as a, a measure the ratio of the double slit to single slit power that should go down, because this is like a lever arm here creates a very sensitive way of measuring how much the interference is changing. And so here's an example of one session. This is a session of five minutes, 600 seconds, where the person is asked to uh, have attention towards and attention away from the double slit in little chunks. And th these bars here are showing the condition. So attention towards, attention away. And in this case, it's a, counter, uh, a randomized counterbalanced um, technique. This is the signal. It looks like it's a gigantic, giant oscillation, but actually this is only because I've normalized the signal. If you look at the actual magnitude change, it's only 0.4%. So it's not changing very much. And the, the goal then is to say, well, we have two different conditions, attention towards, attention away. What's the mean and standard error in both conditions? And you end up with that. So attention towards means put your mind's eye in the box. We hope the, that the interference collapses, and in fact, this is lower than that, in which case this session would have been considered, in fact, was considered statistically significant all by itself. So in the space of five minutes, we got a, a significant effect. This, is, this doesn't happen every time. This happens often enough so that overall it's statistically significant, uh, but it doesn't happen every time. So when you run a bunch of people through this now, you give everybody the same task and do this, the session again and again, one way to cast it then is in terms of the effect size. This is the z-score, which is the overall statistical effect divided by the square root of the number of people involved in it. So we hope for a negative result. These are all people involved. These are the meditators and the non-meditators, and one standard error. So the meditators actually did pretty good on this. This is our first pilot experiment with the double slit. Uh, the other thing that we expected on this is that in order to make a distinction between this is a human-caused effect as opposed to an artifact, we predicted that if you give somebody instructions to now put your mind in the box and now take it away, and now put it back in and now take it away, it actually takes a few seconds for you to mentally switch gears. It's, it has a, a task cost, as they say in, the, in the, the cognitive world. And in this case, we were able to show that it was a roughly two to three seconds of cognitive cost in order to switch the task each time. So that led us able to predict that we should see an effect, but it would lag. It actually would take a couple seconds before we'd see the major effect because your mind wasn't fully engaged. So in fact, when we do this, the lag on it, this is lagging and this is leading, in fact, it took roughly three seconds before the effect showed up. That wouldn't be expected if this was an artifact. If it was an artifact, then something should happen exactly at the moment when the instruction happens, but that's not what we get. So this is now looking at the, uh, the results over four experiments. These are all still pilot studies looking at various configurations. This is what we got in the controls. The controls are all very well behaved. 
we get things that are, don't look like controls, especially in the meditators. Meditators did really well. So the controls look good, meditators look good, so we did our first formal experiment by selecting people who did well in the pilot studies, most of whom were meditators, but some call themselves spiritual healers and musicians and other people who tend to have lots of mental discipline training. And so maybe that's collapse of the wave function. So the formal replication we did, there's, there's the control result, there's the result of the people participating, and this was a whoppingly good result. We then did it again uh, for another sixth experiment. We had a couple of extra ones left over, and it made a very concerted effort to not uh, leave any data aside. So anybody who finished an actual session, whether it was a demonstration or a formal experiment or anything, all of the data is there. We did exactly 250 control sessions and 250 experimental sessions, and that's the whole thing. So experimentally, you end up with 6 times 10 to the minus 6 probability overall, and the control is 0.67. So looks like we're getting something. Uh, there's the result of the meditators. Did quite well. Non-meditators also did OK, but not anywhere near as good. So we published this in physics essays uh, in May of last year. And uh, last year, while, while all that was churning and getting ready for publication, we, we did a replication of this, uh, both in the laboratory and also online. So in the laboratory, again, we're looking for lag effects. So this is being lagged backwards in time. Uh, this is 50 sessions in the lab, again, using people who are selected for what we think is talent in this. And here is the control. And we got a, a very nice result. So overall, the result is somewhere between 5 and 6 sigma drop in interference. Uh, and the control is very nice. I mean, it's close to chance, as you would expect. Uh, here's the l human lag, the reaction time lag. In this case, it was about two seconds. The online one is taking the same optical system, actually it's a duplicate system, and streaming data live from that system to your browser, wherever you happen to be in the world. So we started this on 11, 11, 11. We ended it on 12, 12, 12. 16,000 people from these, all these little dots around the world participated in the experiment. We made a, a bunch of hoops for people to jump through in order for them to actually take the test. And this was intentional, so we'd get rid of people doing it frivolously. So we had questionnaires. We had to get a real email. We had to check it using the CAPTCHA system, all of that stuff. We had lots of bells and whistles in there to confirmed that the data that we actually were keeping was, was correct. We, did, we detected uh, a, a handful of places that were trying to hack our system, probably to take it over to use it to, to redistribute spam or something like that. Uh, one of the worst places is the, the uh, country of Estonia, which, we, which is known for doing this. And we found that we were attacked numerous times. But fortunately, our system was able to detect that. And so we don't have any bad data in here. And the results is this. Uh, this is the result of the experiments. This is 2,000 online sessions. 2,000 sessions that were completed successfully online by the 700 people who actually did it. In this case, there's a longer lag. There's a nine second lag. Well, why is that? Well, two to three seconds is human stuff. And the rest we're able to show is due to internet things such as uh, delays in the server, delays in the internet speed, and, and buffering and things of that sort. So we're able to get uh, about a four sigma effect here in the online experiment. We've learned a, a number of other things that I don't have time to go through on this experiment. But one of the things is we know the IP address of everybody who's doing the experiment. And we're reasonably sure that they are who they say they are because of the hoops they had to jump through. So from the IP address, we can, we can measure how far they were from our laboratory. So the range is roughly one kilometer or less up to 18,000 kilometers. 18,000 kilometers from our lab in California is South Africa. And, and everything in between. So we have a big cluster in the US, a cluster in Europe, a little bit in Asia, uh, and the rest of South Africa. And we can now measure an effect size for each of the 2,000 sessions to see whether or not we get a distance effect. And so there's the distribution of all of the effects for each session. The slope is 0 to 6 decimal places. So there is no drop off, at least as far as 18,000 kilometers go. The other thing that we can see then is well, we have a pretty big distribution of dots there. And you can see, where does the intercept of this flat slope go? Well, it's significantly below 0. So that's just another way of showing that the, we are getting a real effect overall. There's a big distribution 
of, of, of effects within the experiment, but overall it's significant, and we don't see any dif difference at all due to the distance. So we, we should stop the press, and, and we can claim now that the human minds influence the physical world. I mean, in this case, it's influencing it to a very small degree at a quantum level, but nevertheless, still. So this is a little bit like the book The Secret says, and, and the whole realm of affirmations and all of that stuff that you, what you, you think of the gold Mercedes, poof, there it is. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. You might get a, a gold photon for a, a <laughs> microsecond, but it, you wouldn't even know that. So it's not like the secret, it's more like Victoria's Secret. <laughs> it's, it's like Victoria's Secret in the sense that there is a genuine effect, but it's easier to detect, detect when you enhance it using sophisticated technology. <laughs> So if you want to know much more about the experiments that I mentioned, and also uh, many more experiments, including the meta-analyses of the various classes of these kinds of psychic effects, I have these two books. The first one was published in 97, the second one in 2006. They're both still in print. The one that's published in July is called Supernormal, and it's uh, bringing all of the previous data up to date, but it's focusing on the lore within yoga, uh, specifically the cities. The city, city is a, sa a Sanskrit term meaning perfection or attainment, and it's the claim from yoga and other traditions that if you meditate sufficiently, and you practice yoga, you will attain these psychic abilities plus many more. And so I go through the traditional uh, yogic lore, I'm focusing on Patanjali for those of you who know about this, uh, and going through each one of the cities and assessing what has science actually been able to study and what do we think we understand based on uh, what Patanjali said, and was he spinning fairy tales or not? The conclusion basically is that he wasn't spinning fairy tales because every city that has been tested so far, that we've been able to test scientifically, says, yeah, there's evidence that that really exists. One of the huge differences here is from when a city is obtained, in the traditional sense, it's not a hit or miss. It, it's not like you'd get a 32% effect or a, a microscopic effect in the experiments that we do, you get massive effects, things that happen every time in clairvoyance and mind matter interaction, interaction effects where if you need a diamond you can create it, that kind of thing. Well what's the difference? The difference is that in the, the yogic tradition the amount of training involved is so much more than any average normal person will ever imagine doing that no wonder we can't do that. You have to, you have, need a lifestyle and amount of training that is almost unheard of in the modern world. So that's part of it. The other part might be, and I, I didn't add this into the talk, but being here suddenly made me think of it, that there are probably are environmental reasons why people are more or less psychic. And one of the things that my colleagues and I have studied over the years is the effect of the geomagnetic field on psychic awareness. And we know through lots of studies now that both spontaneous psychic awareness and in the laboratory as well are, is improved during periods of low geomagnetic fields. And it's worse during periods of high ge geomagnetic fields. A colleague named James Spottiswood also found, and this is still a little controversial, but he found that there's a, a, a vastly significant improvement in clairvoyance or remote viewing during times of uh, 13 and a half hours local sidereal time. So one of the talks this morning, I was uh, kind of surprised to, with the idea that maybe our galaxy is, first of all, that we came from another galaxy and we're being sliced through the Milky Way galaxy by another one. Well, I don't know if this is the case, but it would be interesting if 1330 uh, local sidereal turned out to be in the other galaxy. You know, it's like, because we're, we're telling time by the stars, if it turns out that that's pointing to the galaxy that's slicing through the Milky Way, that would be interesting. Uh, and the, the minimum in uh, clairvoyance uh, ability is at 1800 hours local sidereal, which is when you're looking into the plane of the Milky Way. So this does appear to, to modulate uh, some psychic ability. We know the geomagnetic field does. There's some evidence that the lunar cycle does as well. And, and these are not actually really tiny effects. They're fairly big effects. And they're, they're physical correlates for what's going on. One way to think of it, especially for the geomagnetic field, is we know there are lots of other correlates with geomagnetic, geomagnetic activity and human behavior. So if there's a geomagnetic storm, the stock market will drop. 
The Federal Reserve did a study showing that that was true. Uh, violence will go up and, and all kinds of things will happen, more accidents and so on. Uh, we, we don't know yet what happens on slower scales like, uh, like uh, the solar sunspot cycle and that sort of thing, but I wouldn't be too surprised if we, were, if we were within cycles where people were simply more susceptible to this and maybe then the reason why 2,000 years ago there were people levitating supposedly is because we were in a different environment which is more conducive to that sort of thing. So that, that's possible. So uh, I work at the Institute of Nordic Sciences. We were founded uh, 40 years ago, almost today, couple, by a couple days. Uh, we're founded by the uh, Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell, who uh, on the way back from the moon to the Earth, he had a, a few minutes of spare time and looked out and saw Earth rise, which is one of the few people who have actually seen it that small, uh, like a little marble. And on um, contemplating that, he, he had a mystical experience which was something which was not expected. You don't want your astronauts to flip out and have mystical experiences on the way back uh, from anywhere. But as it turns out, I've, I've spoke to, to Edgar about this a number of times, and he said that the, the vast majority of the people in the Apollo programs, and even people in the shuttle programs, when you get the, the different worldview, literally, and you're seeing the entire Earth with no boundaries, sitting all by itself out there in the emptiness, or maybe the plasma of space, you, get a, uh, you have a transformative experience. And so he was determined when he came back to Earth to figure out what in the world was that using the tools of science. So that's what our institute does. I basically work in the laboratory most of the time. And, and I think that's it. It is. Thank you for your attention.